Let us pray. Creator God, you created us with free will and the freedom of choice. By the power of your Holy Spirit, speak your word to us this day through the words of Scripture that we may live according to your will through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The first reading from the Hebrew Scriptures comes from, comes from the psalmist, Psalm 37, the first 11 verses. As you hear these words and then the Gospel lesson, Remember that this is the Word of God as it speaks to you. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. And then the writer of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 through 38, takes us on a journey, a challenge, if you will. For here, Jesus is challenging us with this text to do something different, something radical, so radical that it pushes us to a new plane, a higher plane, if you will, to look beyond ourselves and to embrace this approach to living. I say to you that, listen, love your neighbors and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other one. And from anyone, who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind 
to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will, put, will be put into your top, your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before I even get started in my sermon, I'm going to confess a few things. First, the sermon you just heard was a great sermon that the children gave. That is the essence of what I'm trying to say, but they said it more beautifully and more precisely. Preachers, we like to just keep on talking. <laughs> Secondly, I'm still working on this sermon for myself. So as I'm going through it, I might find myself looking at, oh, a light bulb just went off. Because this is an ongoing challenge for all of us, no matter what we do or where we find ourselves. And lastly, I'm going to bring up a name that some of you know very well and others may not know very well. That great, witty, funny, cigar-smoking comedian, George Burns. George Burns died at 100 years of age. But on his 50, 95th birthday, they had a roast for him. And he was introduced with these words. What's so unusual about our guest of honor is that in a profession that is so competitive, when the pressure to make it big is so intense that friends often turn on one another, George Burns doesn't have one single enemy. They're all dead. <laughs> and maybe we're all starting to think, well, that's good. I wish, I'm looking forward to that moment. These days, we are so quick to pigeonhole people, to identify them within seconds as, you're good, you're bad, you're right, you're wrong, you're a friend, you're not. We're always so quick to do that. And we also tend to do it in a very cavalier type way, lifting us ourselves up to a standard that we think everybody would want to reach to. We become so conditioned to doing this that I'm reminded of a letter I was told by a friend that he had received from a little girl. It went something like this. Dear Pastor, I heard you say to love our enemies. I'm only six, and I don't have any yet, but I hope to by the time I'm seven. <laughs> and that's a good attitude to have. Keep on working, and then one day you will have them. If I say, I have no enemies, of course, I am lying, lying to myself and probably embellishing my wishes in order to have some self-grandizement. And by lumping all of those I dislike into one place, those I disagree with and those who I'm a rival with, 
into one category, enemy, well, let me be frank. It's a little easier the list. It's much easier. But it, at the same time, confuses me because it confuses the issue at hand. Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse were rivals. Edison produced the DC current, while Westinghouse produced the AC current. And as factories and homes began to become more electrified, Westinghouse's AC current became more popular. It became the norm, beating out Edison's DC current, and that did not please Thomas Edison. In the 1890s, New York State was looking at a new way of carrying out executions. They were deciding that maybe we should look at using an electric chair and electrocution be the means of carrying out capital punishment. Edison sought to undermine Westinghouse's popularity by strongly suggesting to everyone he met that maybe this electric chair should be run on AC current because he was of the opinion that people would then be revolted by this and turn away from Westinghouse and accept his DC current as the going trend. It didn't work that way. Even when Edison tried to make it even more personal, he came up with a name for such an execution. Westinghouse. That was an unhealthy rivalry, in my opinion. And such unhealthy rivalries tend to lead us down a slippery slope that pulls us down deeper and deeper and tears away at our souls. When a rival turns into adversary, when we intentionally seek to find ways to hurt another, when resentment becomes the driving force and anger turns into hatred, then we begin to see enemies emerging in our minds. So it requires us today to do a little self-assessment, self-examination, to truly explore within ourselves how we are living out these texts. It's also a sad commentary of our human condition. When we look at our own history and the history before us, and hear the vitriol that has been extended out to so many people over the generations, people of good standing, moral character, who have contributed so much to the life of our society, people like John Calvin, Abraham Lincoln, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, even the Dalai Lama. People would go after these individuals with such anger and hostility that only causes me to have more confusion. But this lays a little of the groundwork to raise the question this morning of how does our enemy affect our spirituality? 
How does my feeling for somebody I don't care for affect me spiritually? I'd like to raise three types of response that I've come to see over the course of this week. The first is retaliation, an eye for an eye. It's biblical, so it should be allowed, right? An eye for an eye. Well, there was a man who had been told he had rabies and didn't have much longer to live. And that man started to write some things down on a piece of paper. The doctor saw him as he was walking by the door, deeply in thought, writing on this pad of paper. So he went in and started to talk to him, trying to console him, and even went so far as to say, I see you're writing something. Is that your last will and testament? And the man said, no, no. It's the people I'm planning to bite before I die. <laughs> News reports. We hear them all the time these days about riots, say, in Haiti or Venezuela. Road rage. Out in California, a man holding on to the hood of the car as the car is traveling 70 miles an hour. Murderous responses to, in the whole scheme of things, petty things, petty issues. A man in Aurora, Illinois, who was let go, fired, came prepared to be fired, I guess, and shot people on his way out. All of this and other things dumbfound me, make me wonder what's going on, what's happening to me. How could anything degenerate into such a life-taking moment? If this isn't addressed in some way by each one of us in our own way, it's going to affect our spiritual and communal lives. It's going to spiritually kill us. The second response I came up with was one that I think many of us harbor, resentment. This is one of what I think is one of the most common spiritual problems existing among followers of Jesus Christ. We want to be nice. We want to live out the Beatitudes. We want to be thoughtful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. We don't want to hurt a fly. We want to be the meek who inherit. And yet, yet we strive to do everything we can to get in a superior position, to take down our rivals, to win at all costs, to hold on to those grudges, that resentment, that animosity. But the trouble with that is that it clearly affects us spiritually. Two stories, real quick. Yesterday, we had a wonderful presbytery meeting. And at the end of the presbytery meeting, uh, Chris Torrey, the former pastor here who retired after many years of marvelous service, he tapped me on the shoulder and reintroduced himself. And we had a lovely chat because Chris and I are kindred spirits, I think, in some respects, at least our past. past lends us to that, or at least from my standpoint. You see, Chris 
went to the College of Worcester. He was a few years ahead of me, but I went to the College of Worcester. I transferred there. And to be very quick about this, Worcester didn't have, I don't know if it's still the case, but didn't have fraternities. They had what they called sections, and you, the men lived in these sections, section one to section seven, or whatever the number was. So when I transferred in, I was put in third section. I understand now that third section had quite a reputation. And Chris and I were talking yesterday, and as we were talking, he, I don't know if he brought it up or I did, but he was in section two. And I said, oh, I was in section three for a semester. And you could tell he remembered section three. <laughs> but the story I was wanting to get to is, 10 years after graduation, I went back to my one and only reunion at Worcester, and while there, at one of the gatherings, one of the parties, I met a fellow who was a stranger. At least to me, he was. And we were having a wonderful conversation. Somehow, the section thing came up again, and he was in section six. I said, oh, I was in section three. I didn't think about it. And he goes, oh. <laughs> section six hated section three, and vice versa. Our conversation changed slightly. But as it changed, we started talking about things. And then after a little bit, we started laughing about the pettiness that was so big back then, so important, that I've heard that there were even some fist fights between the two sections. But it reminded me of the fact that we need to be moving on in life and embracing it and not holding on to these resentments and, tempt and uh, grudges and so forth. Because when we look back, it's easy to see the pettiness of these resentments, but it's also easy to see the negativity that emerges from them. how one spirit can be twisted, how one spirit can delve into that dark hole, can be decided by how we hold on to resentment. It's sort of the, uh, what I would refer to as the riptide effect. The riptide effect being, maybe we don't even know we're holding on to it, but as we get far, we don't even see that riptide, and then we get out there, and suddenly we find ourselves 100, 200 yards away from where we had started swimming. We weren't consciously aware of it, but it catches you, catches hold of you and takes you away from those moorings of your spirituality. It takes you away from that center of your spiritual DNA. So retaliation and resentment, simply they destroy, they implode your spirit if you hold on to them. But there is a third way a third way of dealing with our enemies, and that way is known as the Jesus way, or as some might want to even call it, love them into submission. But it's all based in love and forgiveness, in acceptance and understanding. Sometimes, for our own sake, this is the only way that we can effectively deal with our enemies. It doesn't happen overnight. 
It sometimes takes a lot of pain and struggle, but it can work. A minister was asked to work with a highly conflicted congregation that had been in conflict for over two years. You could even tell what side of the issue you were supporting by where you sat in the sanctuary. It had gotten down to the point that in conversations you would hear name calling taking place, finger pointing, anger, backstabbing and so forth. This minister over many months was able to engage the, con the congregation in conversation, intentional conversation, intentional gatherings, where when you would come in, he would divide you up. You, you sit here, you sit here, you sit here, so that you were sitting among everybody. He also brought in people from outside to help teach how you can get through this anger and this resentment and this hostility toward one another. It was hard work, a lot of tears, a lot of yelling at times, but slowly you saw progress. On the last Sunday the minister was there, he did a participatory worship service where he had everyone fill out a piece of paper, two questions they had to answer. Put the name of someone in this congregation that has hurt you. And then the second question was, put the name of somebody in this congregation that you have hurt. Then he brought out a large kettle filled with hot coals, and he had everyone come forward and place their pieces of paper on those hot coals. And while they were doing that, there were prayers of reconciliation that were being prayed by not only the minister, but several other people representing the different factions in the church. And at the close of that service, before the benediction, they carried that kettle out to the front lawn of the church where a hole had been dug, and they buried those embers and the remains from that kettle in that spot. And then they placed a rock over it so it would never arise again. It was a symbolic gesture, but a strong one that helped get them unstuck and allowed them to rejoice and move forward in ministry that continues to this day. I look on something like that as a reminder of what we repeat each and every Sunday as we enter into prayer and say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Maybe it even carries more meaning, meaning for me when I think of what congregations like that do. Forgiveness is the first step to love. So let me ask you one final question this morning. Who is your anger and resentment really hurting? Is it hurting the person you want to focus your attention on? Or is it hurting you? In the name of God, the Redeemer, Christ, 
the healer, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.